Welcome to our live broadcast from the Mountain of God Tabernacle, high atop Mont Eagle Mountain, Tennessee. My name is Apostle Terry Dunn, and I'd like to tell you that we are a five-fold, full gospel, interdenominational church, which offers contemporary praise and worship, the teaching of God's Word, healing, deliverance, prophetic ministry, and much more. We are located in beautiful downtown Mount Eagle, Tennessee at 331 King Street. That's at the corner of King and Fourth. Our Sunday morning worship service starts at 11.30 a.m. Central Standard Time, and everyone is welcome. Now, if for some reason you cannot attend our sanctuary, be sure to join our live stream at wildfireonthemountain.com. That physical address again is 331 King Street, or you can watch us live at www.wildfireonthemountain.com. Good morning and welcome to the Mountain of God Tabernacle. We're glad you're joining us this morning by DVD or internet. We're going to start our section where we praise and worship the Lord with the sounding of the shofar. Forever, and by the grace of God, we will carry on. 
glad he's faithful. His love endures forever. And his word endures forever. Hallelujah.
joy that floods my soul. Something happened, and now I know he touched me.
Oh wait. presence fire glory cloud smell the sweet incense of the holy one more of your glory more of your power more of your manifested presence fire glory cloud smell of sweet incense of the holy one more of your glory more of your power more of your manifested presence fire glory cloud smell the sweet incense of the holy Yeah, we had some minor technical difficulties this morning with trying a different setup and with the batteries not wanting to work. But it's a good day. Good day in the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Paul. Gotta love to worship. All right. All right. Well, good morning to everyone. Welcome to the Tabernacle of God. Thank you for joining us today. Today, I'm going to be speaking on the cup model, which probably not a lot of you have actually heard of, but it is something that's quite important for us to know and understand. Before I begin, basically going to do a little prayer. In the name of Jesus, if you are too young spiritually to understand this, then may you be blinded and have absolutely no understanding to it. However, if you're old enough in the spirit to understand these things, then may you be blessed with full understanding on how this works. Amen. The reason why I do that is because this is something that is kind of high up there, and if you're too young to in the spirit and you start playing around with it, then basically what's going to happen is you're just going to mess a whole bunch of stuff up. So to prevent that, I just make sure that you just don't have understanding on it. When you become spiritually mature enough to understand it, 
It's great to understand because it helps you go further in God. The things here about the cup model is something that's been received prophetically from multiple different people from all around the world in different places. And has been explained to them by God in pretty much the exact same way, including the color code schemes. This is not just some kind of randomized theology that we just decided, oh, let's just create something new to have some strange new something to follow. No, we didn't do that. Um, if you do have any questions or you get a verse or something like that, go ahead, let me know, and we'll go from there. Cup model is important because it helps with deliverance and it helps with healing, and it'll help you to grow spiritually. You, believe it or not, are actually a cup in the midst of the spiritual realm. There's tons of verses in the midst of the Bible that talks about you being a vessel. Um, for example, you have Isaiah 64, 8, where it says that, where it talks about how you are a clay vessel in the midst of a potter's hand. Well, that's you being shaped and formed by God. Then you have things like 2 Timothy 2.20 that talks about the vessels of gold and vessels of silver, some to honor, some to dishonor. You can do a word search on the midst of the word vessel in the Bible, and you'll find a whole bunch of various verses that talk about how you are a vessel. It's not just some little random metaphor that the theology community has come up with. No, in reality, in the midst of the spiritual realm, you really are a container. That's what God made you to be. In the spiritual realm, you are a container that holds spiritual things. Now, there's two parts to a normal person in the midst of the cup. Number one, you got sin, which is what we call the red stuff. Number two, you get yourself, which is called the yellow stuff. However, when a person gets saved, they end up with three parts to their cup which is sin, the red stuff, Jesus, which we know as the blue stuff, and self, which is the yellow stuff. See, Jesus ends up in the, between sin and you because Jesus stands in the gap. That's why he's in the middle. Now, let's review the three different parts to the cup. Sin, hopefully that is self-explanatory on what sin is. But if it's not, I'll give you a little bit more details on it. Sin is demons. It's also sin, and it's also your generational curses. Sin is going to be the thing that blocks you from hearing God. Jesus, which we also know is the water of life, hopefully that's explanatory, but Jesus is Jesus. However, Jesus' part of your cup also contains things like spiritual gifts, say like the gift of tongues or something. But not only the gifts, you also have things such as humility and peace and joy and patience, even things like mercy and wisdom. You know, all the various things that you get from Jesus. That's in the Jesus part. And your self part, that's where your soul is. It also contains things like your personality, your likes, your dislikes, and what you've learned in life. I mean, if you go to college and you learn something and a trade or whatever, that's part of yourself. Even things like theology, that ends up being part of yourself, especially if it has lies in the midst of it. The skills that you gained in life is also part of your life, uh, part of yourself, and also your habits is part of yourself as well. However, not every single cup looks all nice and neat where it's individually divided in three parts. In reality, you'll end up with something like that, which is what we call the vinaigrette cup which is all nice and shaken up. Now, this is what happens when life shakes you up. And Satan will shake you up to keep you off balance. And so you can't find peace or time with God. Now, if you end up in the midst of having a cup like this, then you just need to get prayer and hopefully can get all sorted out to be nice and neat like that. Not everyone's cup is the same. Everyone's cup actually looks different and has... An actual look to it. it doesn't just look like that, no. Every cup is also a different size as well. Some people have little tiny cups that are like a little shot glass. Other people have cups that are like a little beer mug, and sometimes they actually look like that too. Other people might have cups, say, the size of a, an oil tanker or so, while other people have a cup the size of, say, an ocean. 
Jesus had a cup as well. However, his cup was like the size of the universe. In fact, his cup was so big that he has enough Jesus in him to pour out onto every single person who's ever lived and ever will live. And he'll still probably have some left over. Now, the question is, is what do you want in the midst of your cup? As a Christian, I actually hope that you want mostly Jesus in it. If not, you might have some issues if you want some of that sin. Now, the question is, is how do you get the blue stuff in there? Well, you got to be able to get rid of the sin. You see, Jesus does not like being in there in the midst of the red stuff. So as soon as he gets in there, what he's going to do is he's going to convict you of your sins. And when he does convict you of it, you need to repent. You cannot remove sin in the midst of your own power. You have to have Jesus to do it. You see, yourself invited the sin in. If you attempt to remove it, remove the sin by yourself, that is nothing but self-control and legalism. It's like telling Jesus, oh, Jesus, I don't really need you. I can do it myself. And if your idea is that, then go look at the Pharisees who uh, Jesus argued with back in the day and see how well that's working out for them. Once the sin is out, then Jesus will begin to remove the yellow stuff that's in you. Because there are parts of you that he doesn't like. And what does he not like? He doesn't like your rebellion. He doesn't like your selfishness. And he doesn't like the parts that bring in the sin. What you need to realize is that yourself is proportionate to the amount of sin that you actually have. And he needs to remove the self that lets the sin in. Now, how does he do this? He's going to do it through trials and tribulations. For example, you know all those difficult times that you're having in the midst of life? You know, there's annoying and sufferable people that you got to be around, and you got to learn love and patience and kindness towards them? Well, that stuff that's going in, that Jesus is using to root out all yourself. All right. And the main point of doing that is that you need to learn self-sacrifice and reliance on Jesus. Once he is finished getting all the stuff out that he doesn't like, your cup should look more around the lines of that, with just a little bit of you and a whole bunch of Jesus. Now, how can we keep out the sin so he can work out the self part? In order to keep out the sin, you need to be obedient, and you need to learn how to keep your cup full through cup maintenance. Obedience is going to be the thing that keeps your sin out. Now, the requirements for obedience is you got to have the prophetic. You have to hear God. You have to hear God for yourself. You can't go in and rely on, say, your pastor or some oracle or divination person or crystal bar seer to get your word from God. You can't do that. You have to have a direct line with God yourself to get that information. It is a daily walk that you're going to have to go through. You're going to have to take up your cross daily, like it says in Luke 9.23. You're going to have to listen to Jesus all day long, not just when you're in need. For example, you get up in the morning and say, hey, Jesus, what do you want me to do today? He says, don't go into work. Okay, what do you want me to do instead? And he tells you to do something. Maybe he wants you to go to work. Maybe he doesn't. Maybe if he tells you not to go to work, they won't even know that you're gone and probably think that you're on vacation. Happened to people before. And nothing happened to them. Now, how do we get our cup full? Well, I'm going to give you a little example here. All right, let's pretend that this cup right here is you. And this right here is Jesus. Well, we know that Jesus is the water of life. So what does he do? Jesus takes some of that water of life and pours it into your cup. Like so, and then you end up with water in your cup, or the water of life. Now, how do we get the water of life into our cup? We can get it from someone else's cup. We can get it from praise and worship. We can get it from reading the Bible. However, if you've got a really big cup and you're reading the Bible, then it might take hours, like 12, 10 hours or something, just to be able to get your cup full from that. Um, the best way to do it is to ask Jesus how to fill your cup. 
And what he's going to do is usually he's going to show you something in the midst of the prophetic that you can do in order to get your cup filled. For example, there is this lady who asked Jesus, Jesus, how do I fill my cup? And she ended up seeing a river over the top of her head, and Jesus told her, just stick a straw in it and drink from it. So what does she do? She goes, okay. So she reaches out in faith, has the faith straw, and sticks it up into the uh, river, and she starts drinking, and her cup gets full. Another guy, he asked Jesus, how do I get my cup full? And Jesus appeared in front of him with a little goblet, and he said, drink. And he did, and he got his cup full. Me, on the other hand, I absorb Jesus straight out of the air. I can absorb him from a rock. I can absorb him from the wall. Anything that has atoms in it, I can absorb him from the atoms. That's a little bit more complicated, but that's how I do it. Theologies, like the once saved, always saved, we know that's false, but you also end up with theology similar to that in the midst of the cup model. And a theology of once filled, always filled is a lie. I mean, it talks about in the Bible that Jesus is our daily bread. And we, and the concept of once filled, always filled actually goes against that. We need Jesus every single day. We need to be filling our cup every single day. And the reason why that is, is as the day progresses, Jesus keeps coming out of your cup. Uh, we call that the evaporation rate. Now, I'm not exactly 100% sure why Jesus will evaporate from your cup or come out of it, but I can give some randomized guesses. Maybe it's because of your sin. Maybe it's because of the self that he doesn't like. Or maybe he just needs to flow out onto somebody else. I'm not sure. But I do know this. I do have my own little personal experience with it of uh, evaporation and stuff like that. And it happened during a week where the only thing I was focused on was Jesus. That's the only thing I even cared about. And if you've ever been around somebody and you could feel things such as the love or gentleness or something like that come off of them, well, I had gentleness coming off of me and people could feel it. At the last day of the week, I had my cup really, really full, like 103% full of Jesus. And I could feel the gentleness actually coming out of me. But in order to produce that, I could sense that I had to burn through a lot of Jesus just to be able to produce that. Kind of like a concept of burning through gas to produce more gas. Well, I was using up Jesus to produce the gentleness that was flowing off of me. Um, I suspect that some of the different attributes of Jesus, like the love and gentleness or whatever, he'll put that attribute into you. And as he flows out of your cup, the people around it will sense that attribute. I remember there was one person, um, he was a preacher or an evangelist, and he went around and just being in the midst of one room, people would get convicted. And the only thing he did was just sit there and read the Bible. But he had so much conviction flowing off of him that the people wanted to repent just by being near the guy. And I suspect it's from the offflow of the Jesus coming out of their cup, touching the other people. You got to remember that keeping the cup full is a daily routine. It's like dying to self daily. When your cup gets empty, you're going to feel really, really drained. I mean, it's not a feeling of, oh, I'm physically exhausted. It's not a feeling of, I'm mentally exhausted. It feels as though your entire soul and being is completely worn down and you don't want to do nothing. Um, however, on the other hand, when you get your cup full, usually you can feel that when it is totally full. For me, when I feel that my cup is full, I end up feeling a little tingling feeling that's on the top of my head as though I have like carbonation coming out of the top of my head or something. I've been able to distinguish the difference between the presence of God and actually having my cup full. For me, the presence of God manifests as heat on top of my head that feels like it has weight. And I've noticed that when we do praise and worship here, sometimes I'll feel just the tingling, which is Jesus filling my cup. Or I might feel the presence of God and then tingling come in and I have it at the same time. 
but I do know that they do manifest differently. And I've seen people, even elders, think that, oh, it's just all the presence of God, and that's not exactly 100% true. Now, what, can, what is going to happen when we get our cup full? That is the question. What I'm going to do is draw you a little diagram. This should work out well. All right. All right, I do not have a yellow marker, so you'll have to imagine that the bottom part is yellow. Okay, when Jesus pours into your cup, his cup pouring out into you from heaven, it goes in and it begins to fill it. Now the question is, is what happens when you fill a cup that's already full? Something has to come out. Now when you're pouring Jesus into it, guess what doesn't like to be there? It's the red stuff. So the red stuff begins to come out of it. And eventually, all that blue stuff completely and totally can fill your cup and push out all your red stuff. And we like Coke. Now, what's neat about this, you can use this for deliverance. Because if you can get someone's cup full of Jesus, then those demons are going to go away because they don't want to be around Jesus. Meaning that the person isn't going to be really under demonic influence at that time anymore. So there's demons that are blinding them from getting deliverance or accepting their sins. They're not going to be there to convince the person, oh, they're lying to you. Nope, Jesus is going to be there instead, which will help convict the person of their sins. And before all that Jesus evaporates out of them, you can get the person to repent of their sins. You can get them to acknowledge their sins, you can have them go in and do their confessions, and you can get rid of your gener generational curses and eventually break off all your contracts of your demons that are kind of sitting around outside the window or whatever, waiting to get back in after Jesus leaves. <laughs> Looks like I was in front of the camera. All right, whatever. So... That's one of the things that we can do with the cup, and that's really helpful to be able to do something of that sort. Now, one of the neat, well, one of the things or manifestations that happens when you get too much Jesus in your cup is once Jesus is out, or once your cup is too full of Jesus, sorry, Jesus has to come out of it. So eventually he begins to overflow on the sides. Now, light overflows and stuff will make you feel dizzy. However, let's assume that I took a five-gallon bucket of water and poured it over this little cup right here. What's going to happen? It's going to tip. And that's what happens to your cup when you get way too much Jesus flowing over you. And those people who go out, who go out like a light, when you lay hands on them, what's happening is all that Jesus is overflowing on their cup real, real fast, real, real hard, and they go out. Um, one of the things that I've noticed with people who actually do go out from that happening to them is that they end up being in the state of what looks like REM third stage sleep. They're paralyzed, they have rapid eye movements, and they don't do anything. Now, if they're falling on the floor, rolling around, clucking like a chicken or something, that's demonic. That's actually Siphon, Kundalini, Coctress, whatever you want to name them. Now, what can we do with the Jesus that's in the midst of our cup? Well, for one, we can give it away. And that's kind of one of those things that we want to do. All right, for example, back to our lovely little cups here. We already know that we can, that Jesus can pour into us that water. Well, what we can do we can go to someone else and say, here, here's the Jesus that I received from you. And you can pour it into them, like so. And they can pour it back if they really wanted to. 
In addition to that, we also know that the Jesus part also comes across as gifts. So let's imagine that this little rock right here is the gift of tongues. Well, if you put that gift of tongues in somebody, you can take that gift of tongues and pour it into somebody else. And that's called the impartation of gifts. Now, will the rock randomly disappear? No, not rock. Will the gift randomly disappear from your cup if you do that? In extremely rare situations, it's possible. But usually, when God goes in and imparts gifts from you to somebody else, he'll just duplicate it. And each person will have their own gift inside their own cup. Now then, here's an interesting thing to consider. Have you ever been around people who have different versions of tongues that sound differently when they start speaking in tongues? That's because the gift of tongues is not limited to one version. It's more like a package. And the cool part is, is you can receive all those various parts. For example, let's say each of these people each have their own version of tongues. One of them might sound like Russian, one of them might sound like um, Japanese, another might sound like French, and another might sound like Arabic or something like that. Well, let's assume that this cup right here is Ted. Well, Ted can go to person A and say, hey, can I have that gift of tongues? And they say, sure. So they give him the gift of tongues. Then Ted goes to person B and say, can I have yours? And they say, sure. Here, have them. Then they can go to person C and say, yep, you can have that too. And then person D gives their versions of tongues to Ted. Now, what happens? Ted has all those versions of tongues. And what's neat about that? Since Ted has all those different versions, he can access all those different versions whenever he wants. So literally, you can sound like everybody else who has different versions just by getting them imparted to you. It's not limited to just one version nor are you limited to just one version of a gift. You can have as many as you want, as long as you're willing to receive such a thing. Now, how do we pour out our cup? You usually do this through the laying on of hands. Technically, you can do this by just laying on your hands and pushing real hard, not physically pushing them over. No, you push them over through your soul, through your cup, and push the stuff out into them. Um, that can be a dangerous thing, so the best thing to do is ask God to impart it to them. Just lay hands on, God, please pour my cup into theirs, give them my gifts, whatever they need, you know. You can also impart Jesus unto somebody by doing the Great Commission, by going out and spreading the word of Jesus unto them. It may not be a lot of Jesus that's coming out of you, but... The thing is, is the words that you speak will have Jesus flowing on them, which will have the water of life, and it will be received by the other person, which slowly goes into their cup. You actually notice this the most when you have a preacher up there preaching, and he preaches over to the entire congregation, at which point in time the water of life begins to flow onto the congregation through what the preacher is preaching. If you notice at the end of when Terry does a sermon or something, he ends up very tired. It's not because he's doing acrobats or running a mile or something like that. It's because he is pouring out his cup onto the entire congregation through the things that he is speaking. Now, this is what we call the wine glass model. This is basically how the church should be. Jesus, which is kind of like the little wine bottle at the top, is the one who pours out onto somebody. And when that person gets a whole bunch of Jesus, they just go in and pass it on to another person. That person gets some Jesus, they pass it on to somebody else, and it kind of flows down through the entire congregation. If I remember correctly, the books of Acts, those churches ended up operating in that kind of manner. You have to have understanding on the cop model and how that stuff works in the spiritual realm to be able to see it. But that's what they ended up doing. Now, why do we pour out our cup? Number one, we do this because it does the ministry of Christ. We're doing the Great Commission as we go out and speak unto people. We pass 
or impart gifts unto people because people can use those gifts to help expand the kingdom of God. You know, that's the main reason why we are pouring out our cup onto other people. And you also use it for deliverance and things like that. Um, what's interesting, there exists a man named Doug Perry, and he ended up asked, he ended up getting a prophetic word from God asked, that pertained to revival. And what God had told him was that God was waiting for us to pour out the Jesus that existed in us unto other people. But yet, us, we are waiting for God to pour out the Jesus onto everyone. So it's just a waiting game that lasts a very long time. Another reason that we pour out our cup is to keep from going stagnant. You know the concepts in the midst of the Bible that talks about keeping your light hid under the basket or with the guy who goes out and buries his talent or something like that? Well, if you don't go out and use your gift and things that Jesus has given you or even pouring out the Jesus that you have into somebody else's cup of evangelism or whatever, then eventually your cup begins to go stagnant. And you don't really want to be in that because you don't have any spiritual growth or anything like that. Also, pouring out your cup as a way to get an even bigger cup of Jesus. Now, why would we want an even bigger cup of Jesus? Well, why would you not want more Jesus? A bigger cup means you get to hold even more Jesus. And the bigger the cup gets, the more like Jesus you become. For example... It becomes something similar to that. As the bigger your cup gets, the more Jesus gets in there. But the thing is, is your selfish part is kind of like cement and doesn't actually change in size. So it allows Jesus to increase more and allows you to decrease. And this also allows more of Jesus and the gifts to flow through you. However, there exist dangers of having a bigger cup. Let's imagine that you're, it's at night and you're in the middle of a field in the middle of nowhere. If you get a little tiny candle that's lit, then a few random bugs are going to come in and fly around it. However, if you have a 1 million watt light bulb, the bugs from miles and miles away are going to come to see that light. The little tiny candle represents somebody who has a shot glass sized cup. However, the million watt light bulb represents somebody who has like an ocean sized cup of Jesus. The demons are going to see that light from all over the city and come to flock there to stomp it out because they don't like Jesus. Therefore, they try to get rid of it. And that's where you get all your spiritual warfare from. The higher you go up in Jesus, the bigger cup you get, the more Jesus you have, the brighter you shine, and the more demons that try to come get you and hurt you. There's another danger that exists with it, and that is if someone has a real big cup, say like a pastor or something, and they fall, then the fall of that person is going to be really, really hard. Because the bigger your cup is, not only means that you can hold more Jesus, but it also means you can hold more sin and lots of demons. And what will happen is if that turned to red stuff instead of blue stuff, you're going to be crushed, annihilated. I mean, turned over to reprobate mind even worse. That's some of the reasons why some of your big ministries end up crashing and burning is because they don't do cup maintenance, that Jesus goes away from their cup and sin enters in, and then all that goes in and crashes and burns around them. With cup maintenance, usually the, prayer, the pastor or something would stop praying. You got to do your prayer. You got to pray to God. You got to be in constant communication with God. And the pastor will also shift their focus from things like God, which is important, to other random things like, oh, we got to fix the church. We got to build a bigger gymnasium. Got to do that stuff. So God goes away out of the life and sin enters in. And what kind of signs would a preacher see with that? Well, they might see the anointing fade then they'll see something like the gift or the glory disappear, and they'll certainly stop hearing from God and might even get to a point to where they're just hearing from demons instead, at which point in time they're only left with their theology to fall back on 
And then you just get lame, boring sermons about their theological ideas. Now, if we can give, then we can receive. Now, what can we get? Well, we can get Jesus, we can get the gifts, but we can also get people's sin and their demons and their generational curses. And you can also get their self. And you don't want their self. You have enough trouble dealing with your own self. You don't need to deal with someone else's self in the midst of you. Now, I do suspect, I don't know if this is 100% certainty, but I do suspect that you can pass your knowledge and possibly even your feelings onto someone else. However, I'm not 100% sure. It's just something for me to randomly experiment with one day. Now, there are dangers of receiving from other people's cup. Now, if you go in and you admire, like, some pastor or something like that, and you say, ooh, I want everything that that guy has, and then you go get prayed for him to re- pray by him to receive whatever gifts he has, then most likely you're going to get his gifts, in addition to that, his sin and his self. And if you keep doing stuff like that, then you're going to be the one who's rolling around on the floor clicking like a chicken. Okay. The point is, is don't lust after what someone else has had. Only desire what God wants and has for you. Only desire the holy thing. And do not randomly accept what is offered to you. Because if something is randomly offered to you, it might come with demons. The thing is, is witches and warlocks are trained in this. And they know quite well how to pass their demons onto you, as well as curses and other things. If you get prayed for by them, you're going to have a bad day. Now, if we can receive from someone else's cup, then we can also take from someone else's cup. Now, this is what is kind of called sucking out of someone else's cup. Now, there is an example of that in the midst of the Bible. You remember the woman who had the blood problem? Well, when she went in, she had the faith that if she could just go in and touch Jesus' garment, that she'll be healed. The thing is, is Jesus did not purposely heal her. What she did, technically, was she went in, created a spiritual link to Jesus, linked up to his cup, and sucked out the healing from Jesus into her. But Jesus was so aware of his cup and knew what was going on with it that he could feel that healing power leave and go down a spiritual link to someone over there. The woman probably did not do that in great detail, but she actually had the faith to do it. And due to the faith, even though she didn't know the technicalities of it, she was able to pull it out anyway. And you can do the same thing. I even know of stories of people in recent days who didn't have anybody pray for them, didn't have any healing ministers or anything like that around them. And what they did was they reached up in heaven, in faith, grabbed a hold of Jesus' hand, and sucked out the healing power from him directly and was healed. Just because they had the faith to be able to do that. Now, a Concept that might be a little difficult to understand is that taking from another person's cup is not limited to space and time. For example, if I wanted to take from someone else's cup who's in China, I could do that, even though I'm on the other side of the planet. In addition to that, if I wanted to, I could go to into time, go back maybe a couple, well, 1900 some odd years and linked to Apostle Paul's cup, who wrote most of the New Testament, and suck out his gifts too. I know people who've done that. In theory, you could probably go the other way in time and go into the future and suck out from someone's cup there, but you end up running into the paradox of, if the person isn't born yet, how in the world can you do that? How do you even know to take from them? So... I know you can go in the past, but future causes paradoxes, which are quite interesting and way too complicated to even try to deal with it. Um, you got to learn how to guard your cup. And the way that you can do that is, number one, you use shields. And we'll go over shields at a later day and time. 
Um, you can also refuse to let people take from your cup or to receive from someone's cup. Best thing to do is to ask God for his protection. Because you got to remember, God is only going to give you what's holy and true. He's not going to randomly give you a demon just because he thinks it's funny. No, he's going to give you what's holy and true. So you just sit there and pray to God, God, give me what's true, what's of you, and nothing else. If you are taking or receiving, just make sure that you only receive what is good and holy. And that's it. And that actually concludes the cup model. Um, if you really wanted more information on it, there exists a website called fellowshipofthemartyrs.com that you could go to and you can research more about it there. But that pretty much covers the majority of it. They just present it in a different method and way which might help some people. Um, so if you do have any questions, I might be able to answer them. If not, the website was fellowshipofthemartyrs.com. Any more? Well, I'll just go ahead and lead us out in a prayer then. Oh, Father, thank you for what you have shown us. Thanks for what you've teaching us about this. Thanks for what you've done for us. Please do show us our cup. Please do teach us how to do cup maintenance. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup, fill it up and make me whole. Fill my cup, Lord, I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my Fill it up and make me Fill my cup, Lord, I lift it up, Lord, come and quench this thirsting of my soul, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more, fill my cup, fill it up and make me Thank you for joining our live broadcast here from the Mount of God Tabernacle. We hope to see you soon, and may you have a blessed day in the Lord Jesus Christ.